everyone here tonight this is our this is our forum for the uh, 25th senatorial district uh, folks running for this um, I'm sorry to say that one of the individuals uh, Jeff Sean will not be here tonight he is in Jeff City up there the governor called a special session and he is up there he called me this afternoon so I do have a statement to read here in a few minutes for him. Uh, I would like to thank the Country Club out here. Uh, they graciously let us use the dining room out here. Uh, I would like to thank Tyler Wagner from YHC TV uh, for uh, televising this for us. KFBS is here, newspapers here, so we've got uh, quite a bit of media here tonight. Um, I would also like to thank Oren Lindman. I don't know if y'all know Oren. All of the PA stuff here was all Oren's. And he put it together and got it all hooked up for us. And hopefully it will work just fine for the entire time here. So this forum is brought to you by the Stoddard County Republican Central Committee. And I don't know how many of you all are familiar with us. We're a group of a committee man and a committee woman from each township in Stoddard County. We are on the August primary ballot if there is opposition to whoever is currently holding that seat. So let me run through the name of the folks that are bringing you this forum tonight. I am one of them, Ethelene Montgomery. If you'll just stand and we'll just hold our applause till it's all over with then, Russ. Uh, Ethelene, uh, Danny Talkington, there you go. Is Dana McCormick, is she here? Dana? No? Okay, John Stevens. No. He's down in his back. Down in his back, probably out on the tractor or something. No. no. And, and then Alicia Stevens, his wife. She's taking care of him. All right. Christy Edwards. Okay, Josh Speakman. I know he's here. There he is in the back. All right. Farina Hefner. There you go. Gerald Griffin. Is Gerald here? No. So those are the folks that are bringing you this forum tonight. Let's give them a round of applause. <laughs> and we do have a few elected officials here tonight. I think Herman, I think I just saw him leave. Herman Morris. Uh, he's our state rep from the 151st district and his wife Sharon they were here a few minutes ago he's got to go to church tonight um, other county officials here Sheriff Carl Hefner if you just stand up or wave or do something there okay Ross <laughs> Oliver prosecutor okay Danny Talkington, Presiding Commissioner. <laughs> Have I missed anybody? That's a Stoddard County official. Okay. Uh, we would like to now get kind of started with the agenda, and if you would all stand and face the flag, we'll do the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. As I mentioned earlier, uh, Jeff Sean was not able to be here. Let me read a statement from him, and, and nobody is standing in for him. So. He says, I wish I could be there this evening to discuss the issues important today, but I'm currently in Jeff City drafting legislation and holding meetings for our special session on law enforcement issues. 
As you know, there is perhaps no greater issue happening right now than putting a stop to the lawlessness and riots while also ensuring our law enforcement officers have the tools, resources, and funding they need to keep our families, communities, and themselves safe. There are four pieces of priority legislation I'm filing for the special session, and this is a brief overview. The first allows the Attorney General to take over cases from prosecutors under investigation. We have seen severe abuses of power by liberal prosecutors like Kim Gardner in St. Louis, trampling on the rights of the McCluskey family and other law-abiding citizens. My legislation would allow our Attorney General to intervene in these cases. So that's the first one. The second piece of legislation would make it a felony to block a street or highway as part of a protest. These rioters are endangering the lives of everyone in our state when they block traffic and prevent people from accessing roads needed to reach hospitals in our state. The third piece of legislation is the Law Enforcement Officers Bill of Rights, which I co-sponsored last year. This bill will ensure our law enforcement officers are provided with the protection, privacy, and due process they deserve when they are being investigated. And the fourth piece of legislation will criminalize the act of vandalizing statues and monuments in our state. We must keep these rioters from continually attempting to erase history by destroying statues, monuments, and veterans' memorials. He closes by saying, once again, I would like to thank you for hosting this event tonight and would wish that I could be there in person. If you have any questions about these pieces of legislation, or where I stand on other issues important to you in the upcoming election, please don't hesitate to reach out by phone or email or by my website. Thank you and God bless. Jeff. Now the three that are here, we all have name tags out here. Jason Bean, if you'll just stand up. Okay. On this side, Eddie Justice and Steve Kirkson. So now I would like to I would like to uh, introduce Jana Flanagan. Jana is a teacher here with the Dexter Schools. She is going to be the moderator tonight and ask these three gentlemen the questions. And you've already gone over the process with them and they're all in agreement. So, and you've got the bell here. And Charlie's doing the timing, is that right? That's right. All right. <laughs> thank you very much. Um, and Wayne, thank you for this opportunity to do this tonight. I know that this is a really interesting time right now. And probably never before has there been, been such a big difference between Democrats and Republicans, conservatives, liberals, and progressives. And we need to all take the time to really listen tonight to these gentlemen because we need to be able to take that conservative message out to other people when we're sitting at the table, when we're sitting at the lunchroom, when we're sitting um, at the coffee shop. We need to be able to express who we are as conservatives and why we feel that a conservative philosophy is beneficial for our country and why it seems in our minds it is the most constitutional way of thinking for our country. We need to become very good advocates for understanding how to talk about state rights, limited governments. All of you need to be able to understand and explain the Electoral College because let me tell you, that's going to be a big debate in, in our federal governmental system and Missouri is going to be left out if we were ever to get rid of the Electoral College. So educate yourself, know these things, and uh, be an advocate. I'm very happy to do this tonight. I've already spoken with the candidates. They understand that we're going to have introductory questions in the beginning, so you'll get to know a little bit more about them. There's going to be a two-minute um, time frame for them to answer each question. They'll have a 30, chance for a 30-second rebuttal. Charlie's going to be queuing them up here, and if they go over, I get to play teacher and ring the bell. Just like that. So, we are, we'll go ahead and we will um, get on with this. So, we're going to start over here, and we have a very um, specific format for doing this. 
and Steve Cookson is going to lead us off with the first question. And the question is, share with us your educational and professional background. How would these experiences benefit you as a senator? Okay. I was uh, raised and spent the majority of my growing up time in Stoddard County. I was around here and know, and I'm related to a lot of people in Stoddard County. But my educational experience and professional experience, I went over to Poplar Bluff, uh, the Three Rivers Community College, and from there I went to College of the Ozarks at Branson, better known as Hard Work U, where no one pays, everyone has a job to work, and Dr. Davis makes sure that we don't, there's no slackers over there. there we're taught patriotism and uh, uh, we're given work grades and we, we learn a trade basically in, in those skills along with our academic training. From there I uh, went and got a master's from Southeast Missouri State, uh, have a master's degree and then from there, I have a specialist in education from Southeast Missouri State, and I am due to be uh, awarded a doctor, honorary doctorate degree from Missouri State University uh, probably in the near future. So that's my educational background. My uh, professional background, I was a teacher I was a coach, I was a principal, and for the last nine years I was a superintendent uh, and uh, over in Ripley County. Uh, I worked with uh, the faculty, the staff, the school board, the community, and the one thing I learned from my father and from playing in sports was the ability to do teamwork, and it takes team work to get anything accomplished. So that's my background. Thank you. My name is Eddie Justice and I'm from Poplar Bluff. Um, the question was about our educational and professional background. I uh, went to John Brown University in Silent Springs, Arkansas and have a bachelor's degree in business administration and economics. Um, I've been a business owner in Poplar Bluff for over 20 years and I have employed and, and am an employer um, uh, because of that, I know what it means to sign a paycheck on the front and, uh, and to run a business and to balance a budget and to make sure that not only the business continues to thrive, but our employee, employees thrive as well. I've been on the Trump train since he was nominated for, to, as our nominee. I am endorsed by the Missouri Right to Life, and I have received the highest rating that the NRA gives a non-elected um, official. <coughs> That's the educational and professional background. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Yes, Mr. Bean. Can you hear me? My name is Jason Bean. I'm a uh, farmer from Holcomb, Missouri. Uh, I've been a lifelong resident of Southeast Missouri. In fact, I moved a long way from home. I moved uh, 40 feet from the house I grew up in and built my home. Um, I graduated from the University of Missouri in 1994. I got a degree in agronomy and a minor in animal science. And how does that help me? Well, if you look at uh, agriculture as the largest industry in the state of Missouri, you look at the western portion of uh, our district, the 25th district, that's a heavy uh, cattle area. So once again, my background in animal science helps me with that. The eastern portion over here and what I farm being a row crop, the agronomy side helps me with that. Uh, some of my professional uh, issues that I've had, uh, I have had the honor of serving on several state and national boards. Uh, notably, the United Soybean Board is the National Soybean Board. Um, which I spent nine years on. There were 64 directors on that board. One of the things that it really helped me is to learn that you could take 64 people from across the United States, you came together to do the best possible impact you could for a farmer, and that's where I think it really helps me to be your next state senator. Thank you, gentlemen. Question number two. Please think of two or three legislative priorities that would have the most impact on residents of the 25th Senate District, and what would you do to see these achieved? We'll start with Mr. Justice. Well, there's always the foundational issues that, that are in your core that you hold on to. One is pro-life. I am unadulter un un 
apologetic at, as being 100% pro-life. I'm pro-Second Amendment. I know that if, without the Second Amendment that we cannot preserve our rights, uh, any of our other rights, and so I will always fight for those. Uh, but there are other things that we can do to uh, help the 25th district after we have uh, solidified our core values. Um, one of them is that we need to work with our agricultural um, areas as far as increasing the demand for uh, soybean and, and uh, corn production. Um, that actually does help a lot in not only our row crop area, but it also helps in our livestock. More than 50% of the uh, corn and soybeans produced in Missouri end up in the mouths of livestock. And so the, if we can increase our livestock production, we can also increase the demand for uh, soybean and corn uh, production and the byproducts that are used in feeding those livestock. So those are just a few. With two minutes, it's kind of difficult to get into a whole lot of major detail. But uh, I think the agricultural part, obviously, uh, we all agree that that's a major part of uh, this district and, and the future of this district. There are other things such as biodiesel, um, corn fuels, all of these things are, th are, are subjects that we need to address um, immediately in the legislature in order to stimulate the economy. We also have hemp production that um, in southeast Missouri uh, we have some of the best um, cultivated land in order to produce the hemp that has recently been legalized to grow in Missouri. And so these are all issues that I think are vitally important to what we're trying to accomplish down here, and that's to benefit the economics of the 25th district. So my number one priority is going to be economic development, bringing jobs back to the 25th district. If it's one thing that we can find with a positive of COVID is the need to bring jobs back from overseas. We want our independence from other countries. Uh, I've said this to several people, there's no reason we're not making 3M masks right here in the 25th district. It takes two things to make them. Make them. It takes paper, it takes cotton. We've got them both. We've got a great timber industry, we've got a great cotton industry. My number two priority is workforce development. Training the next workforce that we need right here. We also need to train the workforce that we need now, the ones yet to come. So that's my number one. Number two. Number three would be education. Fully funding our formulas. I think it's very important to our school districts because our school districts are the rural, they're the backbone of our rural community. So anyway, that's my one, two, and three. Yes. Thank you. Uh, being the only candidate that has been to the Capitol and worked in the Capitol, I'm an eight-year uh, term limited state representative and I've uh, worked on many bills. Uh, my number one issue, once again, would be economic development. But uh, our economic development depends on our workforce development, which depends on education. How do we educate these students? and uh, the resources that we put into it. Fair funding the funding loan is a good thing, and we were able to accomplish that while we were up there. But, uh, you know, we didn't fully fund the transportation and other vital uh, parts of it. But I will tell you, I am disappointed in that formula, being a former superintendent, in that it, it uh, gives more money per student to people in the urban areas. It is not a really fair formula. I would be for uh, rewriting that formula. Also, uh, infrastructure development, in that our roads, bridges, our ports, our rails, but mostly more important than that, we need to expand our broadband and high-speed internet because I have a son that works for Google and my daughter-in-law works for Facebook. They have to live out in California right now. But uh, we have about uh, 10 to 20,000 jobs in the state of Missouri right now that we're not trained. We've worked, I worked with uh, Senator Lively last term, and we started introducing more uh, coding and things, how to write uh, in our uh, programs and stuff. We gotta expand on that to bring some more high-paid quality jobs, and affordable and accessible health care would be my last thing. So those are my things right there. Thank you. Thank you very much. Does anybody um, want to um, add another comment about those things? 
This time, okay, thank you. The next question, number three, and we'll start with Mr. Bean. What two committees would you most like to serve on in the Senate and why? So number one, uh, you, know, you know, you may be shocked, but agriculture. Uh, I am a fifth generation farmer, a lifetime farmer, and the one thing that I want to see our state do, we it's an $88 billion industry, once again, number one industry in the state of Missouri. I want to push that to about $120 billion a year industry. So that would be my number one. My number two uh, would be the budget committee. Um, and you may kind of look at me and go, why would that be? Well, I tell you, as a farmer, uh, I have, uh, I've been through a lot. I've been through successes. I've been through disasters. And I will tell you, with COVID-19 and what it's done to our state budget, we're going to have to go to work and work hard. One thing that I've learned with farming, I've learned to survive hailstorms. I've learned to survive floods. I've learned to persevere, and I've learned to do more with less. So that's why I'd like to serve on the budget committee and like a seat there. Mr. Cookson. I would agree with uh, uh, Mr. Bean. I would want to be on the budget committee because uh, I have uh, not ever uh, was never able to be on the budget committee when it, my eight years. I think. Uh, they didn't trust superintendents to be on that right then while I was up there. But uh, oh, uh, I did sit in on a lot of them. Of course, the second thing that I was chairman of uh, both uh, education committees, the elementary and secondary, and the higher education committees up there. And with my background in education, I would want to be on the education committee. Uh, I've been on a variety of different natural resources, tourism. I have uh, family, children and family. I've been on a lot of committees during my tenure up there in eight years. So, uh, you know, I would want me on those two, but I'm also interested in everything that goes on in Jeff City because it has an especially if it has an impact on the people of the 25th district. So thank you. Well, it's a, obviously a common theme that we'd all, all like to be on the budget committee. Um, there's a lot of, with COVID-19, there's a lot of belt tightening that's gonna have to happen in the near future. Our revenues are going to go down in the state of Missouri. Our revenues are not going to, and we have to balance the budget. It's a constitutional amendment. So with the decreases in revenues, we're gonna to have to tighten our belt and every department is going to have to be looking for places to cut but my responsibility on the budget committee would be to make sure that southeast missouri gets their fair share and that we aren't taken for granted like we have so many have been so many times in the past my second priority on the budget committee would be to make sure that not a single dollar of your tax money is wasted there is always fat in government there is always waste in government and we have to be on the lookout for that in every department no matter if it's from the transportation to education to uh, public safety to Department of Human Services, all of them are gonna have to look and see if they can find that waste that needs to be trimmed. Education would be my second committee that I would wanna be on. Um, we cannot settle for the way things are. There, is, there are priorities that we've gotta look at. There are schools in this state who have children at the end of third grade who cannot read proficiently. You have to learn to read so you can read to learn. The chances of a third grader becoming proficient after not being proficient is minuscule. We've got to start earlier, we've got to work harder, and we've got to find ways to be better in education. Um, and I completely agree on the for, uh, funding formula. We'll talk about that a little more later. But I can tell you that I do not believe that somebody in St. Louis, a child in St. Louis, is worth twice as much as a child in, in Southeast Missouri. We are not getting the amount of money that we should in the funding formula. Thank you, gentlemen. This next question is rather a fun one. I'm very interested to hear, um, hear from you. What political ambitions do you have beyond the Missouri Senate? And we're going to start with Steve Cookson. Well, to be honest with you, I've always been interested in public policy, but I do not, I never intended to ever be into politics. Uh, it just kind of happened. I was recruited, but uh, anyway, uh, you know, but I, I do understand that when you get to Jeff City, 
You have to work with people. You have to work with committees. You have to form relationships with people. I do have a relationship with Governor uh, Parsons, and he wrote a letter of recommendation for me for any position that I was qualified for, not to endorse me on this. But his words were, I have always known Mr. Cookson to have a tremendous work ethic and constantly striving to serve his constituents in the best way possible. Mr. Cookson served as the chair of elementary and secondary education committees and higher education committees during some of the, his time in, as a representative. In those duties, he worked with a variety of stakeholders to improve both K-12 and higher education systems here in the state of Missouri. Oh, well, that's a quote from him. I have other letters from senators and people that have uh, applauded me. I do have a uh, resolution that was given to me uh, by the former speaker and speaker uh, and uh, pro tem Elijah Har recognizing me for my hard work for up there in uh, Jeff City. So I, I, I only know how to do one thing and that's work hard and I would work hard for the people of the 25th district. Thank you. My political ambition my whole life has been to advance the conservative cause. I never had any ambition to run for office. But I just got really tired of working for candidates who, when they got elected, not only did they disappear from the district that they were representing, but they started running for re-election the day after they got up there. I'm tired of moderate politicians that show that they don't have a spine to stand up for what they believe in once they get into government. It's time for citizen legislators to rise up and make a difference. It's time to get rid of career politicians. It's time to stand up and do what's right for our families. My wife and I have four children. Our youngest just left for the Marine Corps. He is in a boot camp. And that freed up a lot of time and it allowed me to be able to jump into this and to do it full force. But our children are our number one priority and I don't think we can leave it up to the career politicians in order to accomplish what needs to be done. So my number one focus um, is to be your next state senator, to focus on the 25th district. Uh, I want to do everything in my power to try to bring economic development, workforce development, uh, and do everything I can to uh, work with you all to make the 25th district great again. That's my focus. Yes, you may. Okay. 30 seconds. Sure. I just would like to say about career politicians in the state of Missouri, we do have term limits. Eight years is all you can serve in the House, eight years in the Senate. Uh, same as uh, eight years as a governor or any, any other position in state government. Uh, I plan on this being my very last at my age and my life, place in life, this will be my last uh, political campaign ever. So uh, I, I just wanted to put that out there. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you very much for answering these introductory questions. I feel like we've learned a lot more about our candidates. We're now going to think about some policy questions and after each question is finished, I will ask if you would wish to have a rebuttal or to have future comments. So the first question is um, one that has been highlighted nationally. Following the tragic death of George Floyd, the U.S. has seen an increased focus on the role of the police force in the community and whether significant police reform and or changes in funding priorities are necessary. What is your perspective on the national debate that has unfolded and what actions would you take on police reform for the state of Missouri in order to keep communities safe? And we're going to start that question with Mr. Justice. I believe we need to, I, excuse me, I back the blue 100%. We need to fully train and fully fund and fully equip our police officers. We need to focus on the heroic efforts of 99.99% of our law enforcement who do a tremendous job. 
That other fractional percentage, we need to weed them out. We need to send them to prison if necessary, but they are not the vast majority of our law enforcement. We need to salute the heroes that we have in law enforcement. We need to fully fund their equipment and their training, and that's how we have safe communities, by fully funding and fully training our tremendous law enforcement force. So, uh, number one, I do not believe in defunding the police. If anything, I believe in funding them more. Uh, we are so fortunate here in the 25th district to be protected each and every day and night by some of the greatest men and women out there in the blue, and I'm very, very proud of that fact. Um, I think the one thing about community relations I think that uh, we can do as a state senator is to bring those community leaders with our police to have a meeting, understand what their needs are, what they can do one for another. For example, I work with a group in Malden, Missouri called the Positive Brotherhood. Once again, they're not on the city council, they're not mayors, they're just a community group. Bring the police into groups like that, once again, sit down and discuss each other's needs and what they can do to get along better and move communities forward. Uh, to quote uh, a good conservative, uh, did all everything they had to say, I'm good you know, I disagree with everything. Only other thing I would add, I, I want to fully fund them. I want to fund them at, at higher. I've always worked uh, in my record, and I have a record. You will see that I always voted to, to recognize them and fully fund all in raise salaries for sheriff's deputies and, and everything. You know, so I uh, I fully and you know, back to our law enforcement. We are fortunate down here. We don't have those problems. If you don't act a fool like you do up in St. Louis, we're not going to treat you like a fool down here. Our police don't. So, you know, uh, you just need to quit watching TV so much and we need to just start paying attention to what's going on down here. And we're, we're good to go. Uh, I, the only thing I might try to do and I think a lot of our uh, places are is maybe expand our neighborhood and community watches so that each individual citizen is looking out and helping the police to because uh, they need every set of eyes that they can't have so thank you thank you I give you all an opportunity for rebuttal men thank you Next, we're going to go ahead and look at another national issue, but it greatly affects the agricultural business of the state of Missouri. Over the past few years, as a result of the Trump administration's plan to make trade relations with China more fair, China has often retaliated with trade barriers that have impacted many local farmers. If elected, what actions would you take to promote our Missouri agricultural businesses on the national and global stage, especially in light of the ongoing uncertainty of relations with China. And we're going to start that um, response with Mr. Bean. Okay, so first and foremost, I support President Trump and him going after fair trade with China. We have been neglected for years and we should always have fair trade, so I support him 100%. I will tell you that he used his presidential authority to, to place tariffs, and I, I don't know any farmer that is probably in favor of tariffs, but thank goodness we had such a great president that realized that and has done things to lessen that blow to us, and that I'm very thankful of. So what can we do from the state of Missouri from, from my standpoint? Well, first of all, I think that what we need to do is to make sure that we continue to do trade missions to promote our Missouri products. I will tell you, I have been to China, I've been to Vietnam, I've been to South America on those trade missions. And the one thing that I think that uh, you need to realize, when you go into a soybean meal plant and there's two piles of meals in, meal in there, there's one pile from South America and there's one pile from North America, right here in the United States. And you know who they want? They want that USA meal. So they want our products. So I think as a state senator, I want to continue to support the director of ag the Department of Agriculture, I want to continue to support our governor in doing these trade missions to promote Missouri products. Well, 
know, as a state uh, senator, uh, a lot of these are national issues that are better addressed and more thoroughly addressed by working with our, na our uh, national delegation of Congressman uh, Smith and uh, Senator Blunt and Senator Hawley and Governor Parsons. Uh, but uh, as far as what, how to address it, I would just encourage us to keep finding, and I think that's what I heard down at the other end, is to keep finding more markets, not just China, but more markets, even though China is a large market, uh, to uh, promote our products to. Uh, support our ag directors, support the people that are uh, having, you know, this area right here is one of the most fertile fertile areas in the whole world. I mean, it rivals the Nile and everything. It is, it is the, one of the greatest resources that we have is our fertile land down here in, the, in southeast Missouri. So, as a uh, my colleague just said, they want our product. They want our product. So I would just do everything I could to make sure that we're getting that product out to them and explore new uh, markets for them. Thank you. Our president has been put in a very tough position when it comes to the tariffs and the trade deals that were put in place before he became president. The uh, NAFTA agreement put us in such a negative position on trade that it's been difficult for the president to negotiate our way to a better deal. And I don't know the exact numbers, but I'm going to use some example numbers. When China's charging 40% tariffs and we're charging 2% tariffs, we're putting ourselves in a position to lose every single time. And this president, with his negotiating ability, if you haven't read his book, um, The Art of the Deal, I would strongly recommend it. it, it lays out line by line exactly what the president's doing with China and with our with our trade deals and it's very in informative about how he plans to win this this uh, this uh, trade agreement and put us in a much better position to succeed and put America first so I applaud you for what he's doing there is some short-term pain but I believe the long-term game will far outweigh uh, the pain and I also believe that we definitely did not want to stay in the position we were in I support the uh, increase in demand for agricultural, new, ag new agricultural markets, uh, worldwide markets, and international markets. There's always India. Um, it's a huge growing market, and we need to be um, peddling our wares, our agriculture, to those new markets and not depending on China for everything that we get. Um, I commit to vote my district when it comes to agriculture. I commit to uh, promoting uh, biodiesel and uh, it, making sure that our products are used first and doing everything we can to vote for our district's economic advantage. Would anyone like to add other comments? 30 seconds. Yes, go right ahead. I do uh, support our president in his efforts to get more fair trade among and we have been uh, taken advantage of for too long on too many fronts. So uh, what he needs to, whatever uh, he needs to do to uh, level the playing field and have a fair trade rather than uh, the lopsided trade that we've had and has been alluded to, I would 110% uh, support. And I know I talk slow. Thank you. And Mr. B. Just a quick comment. When I was in China and you're in trade negotiations or talking to the Chinese, one of the most frustrating things is we, we get frustrated. We say, why can't this deal be done? We don't understand. If you have five Chinese officials in front of you and you ask them what color this table is, you know how many different answers you get? Five. And that's just tough. So. Thank you. Our next question looks at economics for Southeast Missouri. If elected, what is your economic plan to make Southeast Missouri a more attractive place to live, work, and start a business? How do you promote more widespread economic opportunity and good paying jobs throughout the area? And we'll start with Steve Cookson. 
Well, uh, I think all of you alluded to one of the things. We've got to have better infrastructure here, better roads, better ports, better rail, uh, you know, to move our goods out of here. We're situated in the middle of the United States and we have that advantage. But more important than that, we've got to really bear down and get our uh, high-tech uh, broadband internet and high-speed internet available because uh, you can work. I mean, I, 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 my son and daughter, they work from home because of this COVID. And uh, they can do everything from home. They can run their business and they work for a business, but people can run businesses and stuff and uh, have high paid uh, jobs and stuff uh, just through uh, the internet and having a high speed internet accessibility. It's just vitally important. We've actually kept the state government running with people staying home and not in the Capitol building and not in their office buildings up there by uh, high-speed internet being available around Jefferson City. So uh, I think that's what uh, we would do to help uh, economic development. So thank you. Small businesses make up a huge portion of our economy, not only in America but in Southeast Missouri, and over half of them fail within the first three years. One of the main reasons they fail is because of poor tax policy. We have high taxes on small businesses and we need to continue every effort we can to balance that burden out for small businesses. Another problem that we have that we can work on to make our economy better is our, job, is our labor force. We are struggling to fill the jobs that we have available. One way to do that, I was talking to a uh, bricklayer, member of the Brick Bricklayers Union in St. Louis recently, and he said the average member of their union is 57 years old. So if they, re if they retire at 65, what are we going to do for bricklayers? And it's not, that's not the only skilled trade that has that problem. Uh, heating and air technicians, uh, plumbing, electrical, all of that, we need to focus people more on going to trade schools rather than requiring them to go to college or forcing them to go to college and when it, you know, there's different things that are good for different people, and we need tradesmen. And if we get tradespeople to, to go to those schools and get that training, there are good-paying jobs in southeast Missouri for those trades. Um, we just, and I'll go back and reiterate what I said before, we need to get the government off of the backs of small business people and even large business people. We have the EPA coming down on people a lot. We have to work with the Department of Natural Resources. That's one of the frustrations for me with the Department of Natural Resources is they sometimes have a contentious relationship with businesses rather than a teamwork relationship with businesses. And I think if they were working as a team to try to better the economy rather than trying to have a got you mentality, I think we could be a lot more productive with the Department of Natural Resources. So how to make Southeast Missouri a better place to live, more attractive? Get rid of humidity, mosquitoes, and gnats. That's, that's number one, two, and three. You're going to hear a little bit of the same thing, but uh, our infrastructure, making sure our infrastructure is where it needs to be. I mean, we have a great port location over here on the Mississippi River. We need to utilize that more. Uh, if you even go farther up on the Mississippi, our locks and dam systems are uh, in, in just terrible, terrible shape. So once again, making sure our infrastructure as far as transportation is tip top is one. The other one is that workforce. We need a qualified workforce. The number one thing when people come in here and look for businesses and they don't settle here, the number one thing that we're hearing, there's not an available workforce. So that has to be the key to bringing um, jobs here. Would anybody have a comment? Yes. I just wanted to say that uh, while I was chairman, of, I was on the board at Three Rivers, and the community college is the greatest invention in public education since uh, we invented public education. But we work very hard on articulating agreements between the vocational schools so that they could further and get uh, a certificate of skills so that they could go right out into the workforce. 
uh, I think education has to start moving towards a uh, skill-based education. Skill-based, whatever it is. It's got to be about skills. Yeah, I'll go yes. along with Steve on that and just say that, you know, we've got to utilize our vocational schools. We've got to expand them, we've got to enhance them, and that's key to it. And also, we are very fortunate here in the 25th District. You've got Three Rivers College, you've got the University of Missouri, and you've got Southeast Missouri State. So let's utilize those educational centers to train that next workforce. I think that is just key. We're going to continue talking about public education. and. Uh, talked a lot, a lot right there about training workforce through education, but what do you believe is the most important issue facing public education in the state of Missouri today? And we're going to start with Mr. Justice. As everybody knows, there's a lot of issues facing public education today, and it's going to take a long time to address all those issues. But if we were to address one, I think everybody would probably say funding. Urban schools are failing and it is dragging down our economy when it comes to welfare, prisons, crime. Overall, just our budget is suffering because we have, you know, a lot of our local legislators have done a really good job of taking care of their own school districts, but the metropolitan areas are suffering, and, and they're suffering bad, and when those kids don't get a good education as they've been promised by the Constitution of Missouri and by the citizens of the state, then it does drain our budget, whether, like I said, the welfare system or the prisons or crime. But we also have a problem with funding of quality teachers. We need to fund quality teachers so not only we motivate them to stay in Missouri, but we motivate other quality teachers to come into Missouri. And then the funding formula. It's very frustrating to me, like I said before, when there are kids in metropolitan areas that get $14,000 a year to their school per student. And down here, there are schools that are getting less than 8,000 per student. Yes, I understand there are some cost of living issues and there are some adjustments that have to be made. But there's no way you'll ever convince me that students in St. Louis or Kansas City are worth twice as much as our kids down here. We've got to replace or reform that formula and we've got to do it in a way that's equitable for this district, for Southeast Missouri, so that our schools down here can put out a product that will be per will be what the workforce needs. So there is a national teacher shortage, and that is something that we sure don't want to bring here in the 25th. And I will tell you that we are so lucky here in the 25th district to have some of the greatest teachers that I think are in the country. I mean, I see in our school that we go to at Holcomb, I see teachers pulling out of their own pocket, their own money to help support these children and we're just very fortunate so I think the key to that is fully funding our formula and I know we, we hear that our formula is fully funded but some things we don't realize is that we may fund the formula the main formula but there's like a transportation formula out there ten years ago that transportation formula would cover approximately 75 percent of the transportation cost of the schools today that same formula is covering about eight to ten percent well, that's pulling out of the main formula so we can't give the teachers the necessary raises that they deserve. So I think that's just key. We've got to figure out the funding and make sure we're totally fully funded. The other thing is teacher retirement. They earned it. They deserve it. We're not touching it. End of story. Once again, do Because I am a retired educator. <laughs> So we need to make sure that we're funding that. Uh, and much of my family is retired educators, so it's very near and dear to us. You know, when it comes time to go to dinner or something, you know, we're not having to get uh, commodities or something. But anyway, uh, public education and educators are the lifeblood of a strong Missouri economy. And I, I cannot overemphasize that. Uh, they shape and form uh, what our communities and everything become and what they are. And the communities rally around and have pride in their local schools. And uh, what we got to remember, though, when we look at it all across the state, is 
public education, the problems they're having in St. Louis and Kansas City are nothing more than a reflection of the problems that the society has up there. Schools are just a reflection of the societies in which they exist. If you have good families and the, the, the disintegration of or a disintegration of the family, you're going to have good schools with good families and the disintegration of family units is going to lead to undesirable schools and undesirable conditions and we've got to do more to uh, maintain what we have here in Missouri because I don't know that I can fix what goes on up in St. Louis and I believe me as chairman of the education committee that was what we had to talk about all the time you know they weren't worried about us because we were doing well and they weren't worried about giving us more money but anyway uh, it i'm just very passionate about public education that's all i have to say thank you i'm passionate oh. <laughs> sorry can i rebut? oh i'm sorry i <laughs> right, <I'm sorry. laughs> yes, I was going to say thank you. I'm quite passionate about public education myself as an educator, and so um, I would like to rebut as well, but I'm going to not do so <laughs> and give you all an opportunity. So, Mr. Justice, go right ahead. Sorry to interrupt. Um, I don't know if everybody knows it, but there's been a lot of talk about the possibility of combining retired teachers' um, retirement money with the state program and I can tell you that I'm a strong believer in a promise made should be a promise kept. The state of Missouri has made, made promises to our educators when they retire and we need to keep that and I will fight every day to make sure that that doesn't happen and that the teacher's retirement is left alone and that the promise made is kept. Would you like to? Ditto. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. We're going to continue talking about education here. Can I ditto that too? Yes, you may ditto that too. <laughs> I'll ditto that as well. <laughs> um, we're going to continue talking about education. This next time we're going to start with um, Mr. Bean. And this is a question about school choice. It has often been a conservative platform on a national level. Um, and thinking about school choice for the state of Missouri. Do you support school choice, including its expansion outside of Missouri city centers? And does school choice improve outcomes for students? And why do you believe so, or why not? Okay, so I have no problem with the, what they want to do in St. Louis with charter schools, and they want to have that in St. Louis, because there are some really tough public school problems out there in St. Louis, Kansas City. I don't have a problem with that. That's fine. But as far as expanding those zones into, say, the 25th district, no, I do not support that, will not support that. And the reason I don't support that is, let's remember, our schools, our rural schools, are usually the rural backbone of our communities. If you come in and put another school in, in an area, and you could easily kill four to five schools in that area, what's going to happen to those towns? They're gone. They're, they will not survive. So, no, I do not believe in expanding that zone. Oh, I mean, uh, what you got to remember is uh, when we talk about school choice, uh, that is a school choice to go to uh, uh, charter schools or uh, to go to private schools. Now, I fully believe that every child is a gift from God and they're, they're given to their parent to best do what's in the best interest of that child. If they need to go to another school, then they need to meet with the local school administrators, and if there's, on an individual basis, you know, maybe allow one student or one family to make that move. But wholesale school choice is not the answer to anything. we got to continue to have uh, strong rural schools. Uh, we've got to uh, uh, allow for keep the funding up because when you start letting people move out of the district and go other places and take 
they get tax credits to go to private schools and stuff like that, you're undermining the what the what is guaranteed by the Constitution of the state of Missouri to fund our, and it's the number two uh, budget item that we always pass each year. It is right behind paying bills and debts. Education is the top. So I am, I'm really not for the code word school choice. I am not for school choice and would not support it and I don't think it is proven to be any, on a large scale has been proven to be any effectiveness at all. In fact, uh, the uh, 10 worst performing schools in the state, I believe are all charter schools. So, thank you. Mr. Justice? When Governor Gregg's appointed me to the State Board of Education, one of the first things that I noticed is that there are some schools that have a truly student-based environment. And we've got to get every school in Missouri to have a student-centered, student success environment. And in order to deliver on the promise that Missourians have made to give every child a quality education, we should not, if we're focusing on the students, then we're going to have to have a better way of, a better barometer of how to grade our schools so that we know if they're really succeeding or if they're really failing our our students. What's frustrating for me is to see every time they want to come up with a new way of grading our schools, it takes four or five years. Well, what happens to the kids in those four or five years? We're not delivering on the promise if we need a new way or a new standard to grade these schools. So I would have to say that I agree with President Trump. School choice has a place, but it's got to be done right, and it's got to be done with the students best at heart and not anything else. Because if we don't focus on the student and try to do what's best for that student, then we're failing the future generations of our, of our society. Thank you. Would anybody like to um, comment further? Thank you very much. We're going to um, talk about something different now. And um, this, uh, this, this is a, a sad, sad topic, but it's affecting so many of our, of our people. So besides, in addition to COVID-19, Along with many others throughout the nation, we have been affected by another epidemic, and that is the epidemic of drug and opioid abuse. If elected, what steps would you take to fight this crisis? And we're going to start with, now see I've lost it, Steve Cookson. Well, We've taken steps while I was in the legislature. We always brought up, uh, you know, uh, a, a system of monitoring what drugs. We were the only state in the union that did not have monitoring of uh, prescription drugs out there, which led to doctor shopping and led to people going to the. the uh, uh, they would go to the emergency room with a toothache and need pain medicine, and they would just get a lot of, uh, of those prescription drugs, and they would sell those op opioids and uh, painkillers and everything. Uh, we've got to have a better, uh, and I guess, you know, a really effective and non-invasive uh, drug monitoring program for the state of Missouri so that we still protect our privacies and everything and uh, uh, each individual what drugs they're having to take but uh, that we are able to monitor those that are doctor shopping and going across state lines and getting different prescriptions filled at different doctors and we've got to seek out those doctors those professionals and there's I'm not saying all doctors, but there are a few that are very abusive in the amount of uh, opioids that they prescribe to people. So we want to monitor all of that. So do a better job of monitoring. That's my answer to that. Mr. Justice? 
one of the frustrations I see in Jefferson City is a lot of times there's the my way or the highway mentality. It's like a pendulum. One person's on this extreme of the pendulum, and one person's on this extreme of the pendulum, and it's either my answer is the right one or my answer is the right one, and all everything else is wrong. But there's a lot of room between the extremes of the pendulum, and I think there's a lot of room right here for some creative ideas. The pre prescription drug monitoring program that they've been trying to get passed over the last few years is, is I think, a step in the right direction, but it is, it's, an errant, it's a flawed bill. There's three changes that I think need to be made in order for it to be effective. Right now, the people who the responsibility falls on is the pharmacists. We need physicians, bad actor physicians, to be able to be held accountable for their bad actions and for them giving these prescriptions out when you know they don't even test them for the, for the drugs that they're giving them every month. And a lot of them, if they would test them for the drug, they wouldn't even be in their system. So we've got, number one, we've got to increase the penalties for bad acting physicians. Number two, we have to um, make sure that the only access to this personal information is for law enforcement. Right now, the bill allows access by pharmaceutical companies, and I don't want them to have my personal information. Law enforcement only. And number three, there have to be legitimate and teeth-filled penalties for violating the privacy of the individual. Those are three things that are very important. Now, there's other drugs out there besides opioids that we have a lot of problems with, and we have a couple of prosecutors here in the room. We need to not tie the hands of our prosecutors. We need to let them have a full range of tools to use, and we need serious reform in our probation and pr parole uh, department in our corrections in Missouri. So I feel like we've got to look at this in a three-pronged approach. Number one, we've got to educate our young people. Educate them on the dangers of opioid use and abuse and what it can do to you. Start right there. Second one, deal with our social services. Help give our social services every available tool they need to deal with to deal with the people who, who are addicted and what we can do. And then the third one, I've said this before, give our police the necessary tools. Don't defund, don't fund them more. Give them every necessary tool that they need to deal with these problems. Would someone like, uh, like to add another comment or rebuttal? 30 seconds. Yes. Yes, and I, I do know both of those in that our, our law enforcement and our prosecutors have to have more tools. Uh, you know, it's, it's frustrating as any individual, much less a law enforcement person, to find uh, an abuse going on and see it not be prosecuted and remedied and uh, and we also have to have parents starting early in education uh, also on the dangers of those opioids and drugs what they can do to you yes mr justice i lost my train of thought <laughs> ditto yeah there you go we'll just do it that way <laughs> All right, I got it, but I got my train of thought back. One of the frustrations of politics is when people act differently in an election year than they do in a non-election year. And there is a significant amount of legislators that voted for the prescription drug monitoring program in a non-election year and then turned around and voted against it in an election year. That's not principle. That's not how I will act as your senator. Thank you, and we're going to allow you to keep talking, Mr. Justice, because you've got, you're have got you up first with the next question. So, like many states across the country, Missouri suffers from aging and underdeveloped physical and digital infrastructure. What efforts to improve our infrastructure would you support, and how do we pay for it? Once again, we go back to the pendulum, and you know, there's those that say that a gas tax is the only way to do it, and, and obviously the voters have said, no, that's not the only way to do it, because they've rejected it. We've got to find a creative way to fund our transportation. We should put all options on the table. Taxpayers are tired of having taxes shoved down their throat that aren't dog-eared, and aren't specifically for one thing, and aren't sunsetted. 
they're sick and tired of it going on and on and on, and then another one coming up and it going on and on and on and perpetuate for the rest of our lives. We've got to put limits on taxes, we've got to put dog ears, and we've got to put um, sunsets on them for the voter to agree to do these things. But there are other options besides fuel taxes. In Poplar Bluff, we had a municipality, Poplar Bluff municipality, teamed up with the Department of Transportation, the National Transportation Department, and uh, the Corps of Engineers, and we, uh, we taxed ourselves one cent sales tax, and we funded the four lane 70 miles between St. Louis and Poplar Bluff. It's going to take creative ideas like that. We can't just run back to the same old stale ideas and expect for new results. We've got to come up with some creative ideas. And we've got, a, what, almost 200 legislators up there. I think somebody can come up with some creative ideas. And so we can't just keep running back to the old well and putting taxes on people and perpetually taxing them to death. So, kind of like what Eddie said, I mean, the voters voted to not raise the fuel tax. And, and that's something we just have to deal with. Also, the revenue that comes off of vehicle sales, the sales tax, also helps fund our infrastructure, as does our licensing fees. So it puts pressure back on us, once again, what can we do? I say we go back, it goes back to economic development, bringing jobs back, increasing our tax base. That's what we have to do. If you look in the state of Missouri, there was a bridge initiative done in 2019. Where did that money come from? General revenue. The governor approved it, that's where it came. And if you're seeing the bridge work you are seeing this summer, that's part of that initiative. So once again, bring economic development in, build our sales tax, or build our uh, uh, tax base, and we'll fund it out of general revenue. Mr. Hudson. Sure. And I also agree with, uh, one way to remedy a lot of our issues is to expand our, our uh, tax base. Not our taxes, but our tax base. You know, the more people that came in here and had good paying jobs, they buy better products more often. Uh, we don't have to raise taxes. We just, they will fund a lot of this uh, new ways. And being creative, as Eddie said, uh, I remember, and I was over in Popper Bluff whenever we passed the pet, the one cent sales tax. I will tell you something about legislation, though, it, up in Jeff City. It starts out as a good deal that a lot of people can get behind it. But by the time it gets loaded up with amendments, it becomes an ominous bill, and nobody can actually, there's something in there that people don't like. And... You know, I think if uh, we could keep the legislation specific and clean and the voters understood it and the legislators understood it, sometimes it's hard to understand even when you're studying it and asking questions and debating it. It, uh, it gets loaded up too much and uh, we got to get our, uh, do something to, in legislation to keep it cleaner. So uh, that's one way we could do, and uh, I think the voters would better understand exactly what they're paying taxes for and where it's going, and I agree with sunsetting any taxes that we have, and we can see that uh, they were actually being used for what we voted for. Thank you. Are there any other comments? on the issue of uh, physical or digital infrastructure? Okay, thank you. This next question is um, very interesting. It's a, it's a concluding question, but at the same time, as I said at the beginning, um, many of us have very similar ideas as conservatives. I think the word for the night was ditto. And so right now we need to look and say, what does make us dissimilar? What makes us different as candidates up here on the stand? And so since many of you hold similar, similar views on key issues, for the, this final question, what sets you apart from your fellow candidates and why should people vote for you on August 4th? I really want you to focus in this question on what sets you apart from fellow, uh, fellow candidates. And then after this final question, we're going to give you a, a period of three minutes for a closing remark. 
So, so we'll do that as well. And this question is going to start with Mr. B. So I'm a lifelong Southeast Missourian. Like I told you, I moved 40 feet from the house I grew up in. Let's remember that the state of Missouri's number one industry is agriculture. As a farmer, as your next state senator, I would be the only row crop farmer in the Senate representing Missouri's largest industry. One of the things that I see is I grew up in a time when there really weren't any empty storefronts. Today, from one end to the other of this district, nothing but empty storefronts. I will tell you, as a successful businessman, I've seen the highs, I've seen the lows. I said this earlier, I've been through many a hailstorm, I've been through many a windstorm, and I have persevered, and I've learned to do more with less. And I will tell you, as your next state senator, we're facing tough times in the state of Missouri, and I'm ready to face that challenge. Mr. Cookson. What sets me apart is I've been up there for eight years. I've formed relationships, I've been a team player, I know how to listen, because I don't know everything. I listen to my fellow colleagues up there, the ones that I trust, and there are some you don't trust, and you also listen to those people that come to talk to you in your office, and uh, you want to make sure that what you're listening to is relevant to what's going to be in southeast Missouri. What's important and what's going to help southeast Missouri. That's what you do. So I have that experience. Uh, you know, uh, I, I, I agree with uh, Jason. I know what our number one industry is, is agriculture. Uh, a lot of agriculture in this area is support or they it's the federal government that oversees a lot of it, but the state does have its role in it. Uh, so, uh, you know, as your next state senator, I would already have a, a good relationship with the governor, with other colleagues up there, because one person doesn't do anything. And the one thing, it takes a team. And I've always been a very team-minded team player in everything I did. I will tell you though that it, in the end what you see is what you get. I, I'm just, you know, I've been up there and uh, I was always honest and I worked and honesty is what's so very important up at Jeff City that you trust. You have to be able to trust people and know what it is so that you can accomplish the goals. Mr. Justice. I am a hardcore conservative. You've heard that, but it may not have been defined as well as it should have been. I am an economist by training, and I believe in the private sector. I believe in the free market, in the invisible hand of the free market economy. I believe that money is best managed in the private sector. Wealth is only created in the private sector. And so we have to make sure that we are trusting the people of this country and of this district to be able to handle their money in, a, in the best way possible. So I believe in small government. A lot of people preach that on the, on the campaign stump, but they don't act it out when they get to Jefferson City. If you believe in limited government, you believe in small government, then why has our budget gone from $20 billion 10 years ago to $30 billion today? We need conservatives in Jeff City to limit government and to increase responsibility and let the private sector do what it's supposed to do. I'm a fighter. There is no ambiguity with me. You know where I stand. I don't mince words. I don't talk politically correct. I'm the guy who you're going to know exactly what you're getting. I don't wet my finger and stick it in the air to find out what I think. I believe in the principles that I've discussed with you today, and I will listen on everything else to what you have to say and what the best decision is. I don't make election year decisions. It's frustrating to me, especially in the pro-life arena, when legislators say, I'm pro-life, I'm going to protect the unborn, I want to protect those that can't protect themselves, and they get up there in their whole first session, they don't file a single bill about protecting life. But then election year comes around next year, 
and they do six bills, and then all of a sudden the hero of the Missouri Right to Life Association. We need honesty, we need integrity, and we need somebody that's got the backbone to stand up and say, this is right, this is the hill I want to die on, I'm going to represent my constituents. Thank you very much. And that's the end of our formal questions, but I do want to give you each um, three minutes to uh, follow up on anything, add anything additional that you'd like to say, something that we didn't cover that is important to you. And um, so thank you very much. And we will start with Mr. Cookson. Once again, I've been to Jeff City and uh, no, it's not it's a long way and hard to get there from here, and I'm glad, except whenever I have to drive up there. Uh, it is, it is, it's a nasty place that's just, it's all about money, you know. It's about money, and I know the world is supposed to be about that, but uh, I will tell you that uh, I have been endorsed every year that I was up there for eight years by the NRA, the Missouri Right to Life, and I was a friend of agriculture award winner from Farm Bureau. I am the only candidate that on all my literature and all my signs, I put that I am a Republican. I am a Republican because that is what I am. I am proud of what I am. Uh, I'm proud that I'm from Southeast Missouri, that I grew up down here. Uh, I'm, uh, what you see is what you get. I do not have a campaign manager. I, my budget for my campaign is uh, maybe $40,000, one year salary. I, I don't have, I'm not going to spend a half a million dollars and put out everything. I'm going to run a positive campaign and have run a positive campaign just on my credentials and what I have to offer to the citizens of the 21st. I mean the 25th district. Once again, like I said, I am what you see is what you get. Uh, you don't have to worry about me taking uh, a lot of money from Kansas City, St. Louis, or Jeff City, Columbia. I, I'm just not going to, because with that money, you owe them something. You know, you owe them something. I'm going to be who I am. You, the citizens, are going to be my campaign managers. You're the people that I want to listen to, and I will always, always listen to you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Justice. I've made a point during this campaign, and it's been a long one. I started running in February of 2019, and uh, then COVID hit. It's been quite the, uh, the roller coaster. But I've been very clear that I will only make one campaign promise in the entire campaign and we've got six days left and I've made sure that that's the case so far. But I will be a present senator. It's very frustrating when you elect somebody to office and the day after they have been elected and they go to serve, they disappear until they need your vote again and then they come back around. That's one of the motivations for me to run and so I don't want to be those that thing that's frustrated me and I promise to be a present senator. I'm a lifetime conservative Republican. I have been, when I was four years old, my dad was tired of me messing around the house and so he gave me a stack of leaflets for a camp for a buddy of his that was running for state rep and said, go put one of those on every door and don't come back until they're gone. And so that was my first initiation into a political world and then when I was a sophomore in high school, my uh, biology teacher um, put in a movie and it was a documentary called The Silent Scream. And if you haven't seen it, I recommend that you go watch it on YouTube, but it's a, it's a video about what actually happens in an abortion. And that had such a profound effect on me that I have wanted to defend the, those that can't defend themselves ever since. I wanted to be involved in the public realm. But, I can, but as a lifetime conservative Republican, I've never donated a dime to a Democrat candidate because my principles are that important to me. And you give your money, you put your money where your principles are. And so the, I want, want everybody to know that that is that important to me. I believe in the cause, the conservative cause. I've lived it, and I will continue to live it as your state senator. Thank you.
So uh, before I get started, I'd just like to say we've had how many of these forums? Five, six forums, and uh, you know, as all of us being together, we have been pretty civil, and, and I really want to say I just appreciate that because that's the way it should be. But uh, just to finish it up, uh, I'm 100% pro-life, uh, proud to be endorsed by Missouri Right to Life, proud to be endorsed by Missourians for Life. Uh, I'm a huge defender of the Second Amendment. It is our right to protect ourselves, our families, our property. Um, I'm very proud to be endorsed by the Fraternal Order of the Police. I've been a lifetime member of the NRA, um, have the highest rating you can have uh, running as this race as you can without being an elected official. Uh, I'm very proud to be endorsed by Missouri Cattlemen. I'm very proud to be endorsed by the Missouri Farm Bureau. I want to finish up to say this, that uh, those of you who knew my dad, he made a deal with me. He said, son, I'm going to give you the farm. Actually, he wanted a dollar. But he said, there's two things you got to do. One, I want you to get your college education. And I did. The second thing that he made me do, he wanted me to do every single job on the farm. So whether it be changing a wheel bearing, whether it be driving a tractor, whatever it is, I can change a seal on a cylinder, I can do that. I'm going to take that same work ethic with me to Jefferson City as your next state senator because I still do it on my farm today. But there's one thing that I have been very fortunate in my life and I've been very successful in my business is because I have worked together with people. So. I've got two favors to ask. One, I'm going to ask for your vote on August 4th. And the second thing is that we work together to make Southeast Missouri a better place. Thank you. I want to thank um, all of our candidates that are here. And let's go ahead and give them all a round of applause. And I have to say, I was a little disappointed I didn't get to ring my bell. Go ahead. <laughs> One thing I would like to remind you all, next Tuesday is Election Day. So hopefully here tonight, these gentlemen have maybe helped you to make up your mind on which one of these three or four gentlemen here is going to be your candidate that you're going to vote for. So let's make sure next Tuesday, everybody out here goes to vote. Make sure you get all your friends and neighbors to vote. And we'll be watching the TV that night to see which one of these four gentlemen wins. Thank you all for coming out tonight. Ethel? Wayne, I know they're busy campaigning, but Mr. Justice came by our headquarters today. We got to meet two ladies and they had some questions for him. It would be nice sometimes if some of the other ones could come by. And I mean, we're not real busy at times, but if they just come and spend a little bit of time and all of that. I would suggest that. See, I've come by two or three times and found nobody there. If you go on Mondays, there won't be there won't okay. anybody there. Okay, maybe I just missed the wrong times, but uh, I'm sorry if I have a try again. Uh, well, I'll keep, hey, I have to be persistent. I'm persistent. No, I agree, but I've been by twice and got to meet a lot of really good people there and answer some questions. So. Absolutely. I appreciate you all having that office and uh, like I say, just get out and vote. We have all kinds of yard signs out there, bumper stickers. We got Trump stuff out there, all that kind of stuff. So pay a visit out there. And if you don't know where it is, it's it's almost directly across the street from the Hickory Log. It's down this little lane. It's the first building on your left there. Uh, and we are there much of the time. I'm, I'm working all the time. Okay. All right. Now, this will conclude our uh, forum tonight. I'm sure these gentlemen are going to stick around for a few minutes. So if you have some questions, your own questions. No, you can't leave. If you have some questions for them, come on up here and ask those questions. Thank you all for coming. Good night. I like, I like structure. I just want to make sure you guys get it.